please have a seat. <clears throat> Let us pray. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. In my experience, the concern of almost every parent is for the safety and well-being of their beloved child. And for Christian parents, the question of the eternal security for their children becomes central. I know since having kids, much of my prayer life is consumed with praying for my two sons. We Christian parents pray that our children would grow up to know and love Jesus as we do. We take them to church, send them to Sunday school, read the Bible to them, pray for them and pray over them and much, much more. We hope in earnest hope that our kids will become Christians and have a lifelong saving relationship with Jesus. The question then is what place do children have in the kingdom of God? And our Bible reading today speaks volumes to that. The assumption in the scriptures is that people who come to faith in Jesus Christ are adults. They are old enough to understand the facts about his life, death and resurrection. And then they put their trust in him as their saviour and their Lord who atoned for their sins and rose to everlasting life. What then does this mean for little children? Jesus in our reading is busy teaching the multitudes who had gathered to hear him about the nature of the kingdom of God. Suddenly in the middle of his teaching, some parents push through the thick crowd. They present their children to him Scripture informs us some are just tiny infants. They want Jesus to lay his hands upon them, a simple touch, a blessing and a prayer. Now to us, that seems a pretty tame image. We in fact have a stained glass window over there of Jesus cuddling little children. It's very familiar to most people who are raised in the church. But in the context of first century Israel, it was a radical thought for a rabbi to invite, to, to take children unto himself and to bless them. Women and children were frequently in ancient Israel treated as second class citizens and were not even welcome to speak in the synagogue assemblies. These parents must have seen that Jesus was unique. He was special and they wanted to present their children to him. So in the context of Jesus teaching about the kingdom, I wonder if they were pushing their children through the crowds to be, to be near Jesus in the hopes that perhaps he would speak on the place of children in God's kingdom. Like all parents of faith, I wonder if they were anxious about their children's salvation. But as the children come near, the apostles rebuke the parents. The apostles make a dire mistake. They think that Jesus, as an important rabbi and teacher, didn't want children bothering him with interruptions. However, Jesus, as always, had everything in perfect perspective. He valued the beautiful children more than having an uninterrupted sermon. The Lord's rebuke to the apostles still has resonance in our world today. Sadly, many children are exploited, treated as less than human, and thought of as disposable inconveniences. Jesus turned and, as he frequently did, rebuked the rebukers, saying, Let the children come unto me, and do not stop them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say unto you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a small child shall not enter it. These words are very famous, often quoted. We take them for granted, but they are piercing words. They cut to the core of our questions about faith and the kingdom of God. It's a sublimely powerful statement 
and a sublimely powerful image as Jesus talks about entrance to the kingdom while cradling little children in his arms. To have eternal life, he says, we must enter the kingdom by becoming like children. Jesus gives us an implicit teaching here that I think is important to touch on before I move on to the more direct teaching. In my pastoral ministry, I have come across many families who have tragically lost their children to stillbirths, miscarriages or terrible accidents. The question invariably arises, do you think I will see my baby in heaven? And I emphatically answer, yes. Children go to heaven because until they are old enough to choose otherwise, they are part of God's eternal kingdom. Thus, little Coco is about to be admitted into the life of the church through the sacrament of baptism. And her parents and godparents, like so many other people throughout Christian history, will offer her a life in the place of God's church and prayerfully hope that one day she will grow up to accept by faith in Jesus Christ the offer of eternal life with God that is extended through the sacrament of baptism. The wonderful comfort of God's special love for little babies and children is a rich source of blessing. But our verse today deals with a far more direct teaching of Jesus as he uses the little children as an illustration to demonstrate how adults are to enter God's kingdom. Have you ever thought about how helpless children and babies are? Their utter dependence and trust on those who love and provide for them, according to Jesus, is the perfect metaphor for humble faith in God which grants entrance to heaven. Jesus isn't presenting a romanticised view of children here though. Living in a tight-knit Middle Eastern village and being raised as the oldest sibling of a large family, our Lord would have been keenly aware of how annoying and challenging children can be at times. But he sees the simplicity of a child's love and trust as that essential metaphor for gaining eternal life. Like little children love and depend on their parents, so we must come to love and depend on our God. The next teaching from our reading today is about the rich young ruler and there is a definite purpose. It's not by accident that St Luke put these two stories together. Moments after Jesus has said, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child shall not enter it, a rich young man appears and approaches Jesus who presumably was still surrounded by little babies and children. The wealthy and influential young man is also curious about salvation. Asking the Lord, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I think it's highly ironic that he asked that question. Because Jesus had just answered it. You see... Children, as an illustration of helplessness and dependence of God, are the polar opposite of the rich young ruler. This is a man who has everything. He has money, he has power, presumably he has influence, and at the top of, and to top it all off, he's very religious. He approaches Jesus with confidence and a sort of determination, seeking to impress Jesus by his moral record and religious piety. But he gets a rude shock. The key to understanding the error of the rich young ruler lies in the original question he asks. What must I do to inherit eternal life? A far better question would have been, good teacher, what has God done to give me eternal life? Because of his wealth and religious devotion, he believed he had something to offer God for his salvation, missing the truth of Jesus' teachings. He had come to Jesus asking how to have eternal life, but he didn't like the answer he got. The modern equivalent might be a millionaire who comes to church every Sunday, 
who gives very generously in their contributions to church and charity and is confident in their knowledge of the prayer book and liturgy and they think that through all that they are saved. To inherit eternal life and treasures in heaven, the rich young ruler would have to abandon his earthly self-sufficiency. It's not that being rich prevents a person from going to heaven. Jesus just says it's very difficult, not impossible. But as Jesus points out, worldly wealth frequently forms a kind of powerful distraction from true faith and causes a puffed up sense of self-saving ability. For many rich people, a relationship with Jesus is something they would like to buy and tack on the side of their earthly pleasures. If push came to shove and they were to abandon everything they had in order to enter the kingdom of God, they may not do it. If we think of the kingdom of God as something we can earn or buy our way into, it becomes something we are very unlikely to enter. To be saved, we must become like little children who have nothing and cannot count on their own achievements. We can do nothing to earn salvation. Nothing we offer is worthy. And because, because everything about us is stained by sin, we cannot buy our way into heaven because salvation is a free gift from God, entirely dependent on his grace and mercy. Even our best offerings to earn salvation, to buy or bribe our way into the kingdom of heaven, fall short and are nothing to God. To enter God's kingdom and to be saved, we must abandon self-trust and self-reliance and place all our faith, our hope and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice on the cross and his glorious resurrection from the dead. The love of God is so ridiculously radical, so amazing, that even in the face of our sinfulness and our shortcomings, our inability to save ourselves, Jesus died to save us. The response God wants from us isn't working hard to be saved or religious piety or moral adherence, but a childlike faith in Jesus Christ as Saviour, as Lord. All those other things are good things, but faith in Christ alone is what saves. If Billy Graham goes to heaven, it won't be because he aided in the salvation of thousands of souls, and I'm sure he has. If the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, goes to heaven, it won't be because of his episcopal authority. If Father Shane goes to heaven, it won't be because he's a great preacher and a good priest. If I go to heaven, it won't be because of anything I've ever said or done to get in there. It will be because of faith in Jesus Christ. If you want to enter the kingdom, then you must enter it spiritually naked, helpless and clinging only to the cross of Jesus Christ. To have eternal life, we, like little babies, must lay aside our complex arguments, our intricate theologies and myriad of distracting idols that divert our attention from the one true God. We must simply accept that there is a God who loves us, who made us and desires to have a relationship with us through his son, Jesus. Like babies who trust in their parents, we must implicitly learn to trust God for our salvation and to seek the kingdom at the expense of everything else in our lives. Like a newborn baby that comes into the world, naked and crying and helpless, relying on her mother's milk, love and affection for survival, so too we must humble ourselves before our God and put all our faith and trust in his Son for our eternal security. We must be honest with ourselves and acknowledge our own wretchedness and spiritual infancy, our helplessness before the Lord. Like vulnerable naked newborn babies we have nothing to offer their, who have nothing to offer their parents for love and safety and protection, we offer God nothing to earn our place in his eternal kingdom. 
our own efforts, good morals or religious activities, wealth, political influence or power, anything else we can, we can offer. They can never be enough to save us from our sins. They can never be enough to give us a, a saving relationship with God. Only recognition of our total helplessness and faith in our loving Lord Jesus can save us. We must accept Christ with all the love, joy and trust of a little child. Amen.